Welcome to Africa in Motion 2020. My name is Tega Okiti. I'm a film curator and writer, and it is a wonderful pleasure to be joined today by two of the three filmmakers of the Surreal 16 Collective, CJ Obasi, director of Suffer the Witch, and Mike Omonua, director of Love Potion. Welcome to you both. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right in um and my first question i guess it's it's a simple one but like a really important one like where did you why where and like or how did you decide to shape this particular anthology that you've created around juju uh maybe mike do you want to start okay okay sure um uh, I don't know. I, I guess the idea came about quite uh, organically um, through just a lot of us talking together about potential project ideas. Um, I don't know specifically exactly when, you know, the idea came, I think maybe 2018 or something around that time. So like two or three years ago, um, we came, I think, mostly generating our ideas off of like WhatsApp conversations in our WhatsApp group. And at some stage, we just came up with the idea of like Juju Stories, a sort of a three part um, anthology uh, film exploring um, supernatural tales around Juju. Um, but I can't give a definitive specific time when that idea sort of generated. I think it just came around really organically. Um, and then we just started listing different Juju stories. Uh, in Nigeria, sort of folklore and, and Nigeria culture that we know about. Um, and I think we had like a really long list and just started picking like specific tales that we could um, uh, um, explore further. And we sort of wrote our screenplays and looked at each other's scripts and and it sort of just went from there. But um, I think it was 2018. I, I can't remember exactly when it, you know, when our idea sort of really came into form. Maybe CJ knows more. Well, it's really interesting, just before you chip in, CJ, that you say that um, it happened organically, because I think one of the things that really struck me about, like, watching, I'm familiar with your collective, and we'll talk about that shortly, but what struck me is even though they are genre films, they're very, to me as a Nigerian, they also feel very everyday. And I don't know what that means. So I'm really, in so what is really interesting to me is, like, or getting your thoughts on how, what do you think that kind of says, like the presence of sort of like Juju and the supernatural in a very modern, a very contemporary country? Like, what do you think that kind of says or is saying about where Nigeria is at? Um, I don't know. Uh, I feel like we're, we're, we're still stuck in the past, but also trying to sort of modernize um, at the same time, so there's like a sort of dislocation there where people will look at like like Juju and be terrified of it still and still feel like, you know, um, all these sort of supernatural tales are reality, you know, no one takes it for granted or anything like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's a more... Um, there's, uh, there's kind of like westernization of society going on where people are becoming a little bit more secular um, and less into sort of these sort of spiritual tales. Um, so I guess you see the sort of two worlds. I'm tr we're trying to like combine those sort of modern and the old world. Um, but I, I feel like, although we're, there's a lot of westernization in Lagos specifically in Nigerian society, they do sort of retain those old um, uh beliefs in in sort of juju and in in the spiritual and and in these kind of like urban legends as well people really do believe in you know juju and do believe that everything like like all these tales that we have um they're they're well-known stories here you know they're not sort of made up they're actually sort of like urban legends um and folklores that have been sort of passed down um or passed from pe person to person um, so I, yeah, there's, there's 
sort of two worlds combining, two worlds sort of clashing. Um, and at least that's what I feel anyways. CJ, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I agree with uh, everything Mike said um, in regards to how the stories came together. They came together quite organically. Um, and, and yeah, I think it was around 2018 that um, um, these uh, stories started, we started to um, compile these stories. And um, for me, it's, it's really just a continuation of what we set out to do as a collective. You know, which is to to tackle you know these surrealistic um, themes within our society, because when you look at you know the Nigerian society, you have you know um, you know like Mike mentioned, you know people stuck in the past, you know, but also trying to be modern. So it's almost like you have um, two worlds colliding together or living you know opposite each other. So um, it's for me. I've always found that interesting. So on, on one hand, you have people who who swear that you know these things are backward. These things are you know don't, you know are they you know they are they are evil and all of that. But on the other side, you also have people. The same people are afraid of them. The same people you know won't mess with them. So it's 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 all. I've always for me personally, I've always found that interesting. And within all the key stories is what I find, I find um, an expo exploration of those fears, as well as, you know, the idea of, you know, these parallel worlds that exist. And I think that's a really, like, Juju is also like, in watching the film, it feels like a really useful sort of like placeholder for other themes or sort of like other sort of ills or sort of fractures in society or just these like themes like Abba's film Yam it, it, I think it speaks a lot to sort of to social deprivation the and and that's sort of like how the supernatural is kind of working and I think in um your film like the Juju seems like a, a placeholder to explore desire um so I wanted to like ask you a little bit about that in a sense of just like what in your individual sort of like choices, what was it about Juju, the supernatural and like this study of desire that attracted you? Yeah, um, it is, yeah, it is definitely a film about uh, um, someone desiring something. And then once they uh, get, you know, the object of their desire, then realizing that maybe it wasn't actually something that they um, may have wanted in, in in the first place. Yeah, you could say that the um, Juju, you know, the idea of the supernatural was used to just explore that idea, that concept um, of a woman, you know, going after a guy that she really likes. And then um, once she gets close to him, um, realizing that what the person she had met, imagined who he was in her head isn't actually the the same as the reality of the person in real life. Um, so yeah, it's uh, you know with genre films, I guess you can always use them as um, uh, placeholders in a way to sort of explore whatever sort of idea or story you know or theme or or anything you kind of. Um, what want to explore um there's always something going on underneath the um the supernatural so to speak um so yeah it, you know essentially it is me trying to tell kind of a love story but not quite a love story um but in a sort of supernatural kind of um uh in a, in a sort of supernatural genre and supernatural world yeah i feel like hmm. you just perfectly described like your approach at the moment like where you said like love stories but not quite love stories and I'm really curious and sort of like having seen a lot of your work like what do you, do you is there a sort of like personal fascination or connection to sort of like love and romance and these ideas of like desire and yearning and things like that like for you yeah yeah definitely I um I always feel like um you know, in any sort of relationship um, between any sort of couple, um, I always feel there's a lot 
there's a lot going on, you know, in terms of, um, uh, say, there's just a lot going on between couples, you know, uh, under the surface that, you know, rarely gets um, seen by outsiders. You have to sort of be in it to sort of understand it. And and I guess anyone who's ever sort of been in a relationship with uh, anybody knows that it's never as simple as guy falls in love with girl or girl falls in love with girl or guy falls in love with guy, whatever. It's never that simple, you know. Um, there's always uh, there's always that thing that just what's the word like there's always it's never perfect i guess i can put it that way it's never perfect so um and i'm trying to sort of look at those sort of non-perfect areas um i guess uh, as much as possible um and I, you know i like i like the way sort of um uh one car way explores these ideas as well in his sort of films between people you know there's always a lot of unrequited love in his films or the sense of um, right person, wrong time type thing in, in, in his uh, body of work. And I, I, I like that sort of exploration, just, you know, looking at love in, from sort of different angles, you know, I guess I could put it that way, yeah. That's a really great reference, actually, because when I see does hmm. have a very strong, like, Maggie Chung sort of energy in this sort of, yeah. this sort of very pensive nature. Hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And with you, with you say, like, I would, I tried, I feel like desire and yearning is quite a clear sort of theme, but I really, I felt slightly challenged in trying to, like, place what the Juju placeholder is in, like, your work, because it's in sort of, like, reading up about the film, you said it's kind of based on a true story. So I'm curious in terms of, like, how, or personal experience, something like that, um so yeah like how was it working with you specifically um in the story that you told with Suffer the Witch okay. yeah it was a it was based on a true story and which I actually wrote as a short story at the time that it happened and you can find the short story it's published somewhere in Amazon or something but it's it was based on a real life experience and it happened in a university that I used to go to and there was this girl called Joy, <laughs> as in the story. And uh, she, everyone pretty much thought she was a witch, you know, in, in school. And when you look at her, there's nothing about her that, you know, would suggest. I mean, if you go by stereotypical depictions of what a witch is supposed to look like or supposed to act. So there's nothing, you know, she's just very unassuming. You know, she's not like, you know, traditionally beautiful, you know, even though I would say she's good looking, you know, she never dresses in any way that is even sexual or overtly, you know, trying to, you know, create uh, an impression of fashion or whatever, just dresses plainly. In fact, you would call, you would probably call her Clay J if you saw her just from, you know, um, just, you know, on first sight. But when you start to interact with her, then you begin to notice a few things. One of which, for example, is she might say that, she might tell you something that you know for sure that nobody else knows this. And you wonder how. And then she would give you a look like, you know, almost like, I know I'm not supposed to know this, but you know, what are you gonna do? You know, and then, you know, I, every once in a while, the one that, kind of blew my mind was like, and I still can't explain it to, to today is you could be having a conversation with her in one place and then just walk like five blocks down the street and there she will be there, just, you know, inexplicable. So around this period of time, everyone in the school would say she's a witch, she's a, you know, there, was, there are these rumors, but nobody had any proof for sure that she was a witch. And in my head, I've, I've always thought, you know, like if we had witches existing in our society, they would be like, just like every other human being. There wouldn't be like people, you know, you know, dressed in, in rags or, you know, looking like hags. They would just be like regular folks, you know, but with spiritual, supernatural power. So um, for me, it was within this space that I, you know, started to 
explore the, the idea of witchcraft. And if, if, you, if you remember, in one of the points in our manifesto, we said no uh, cliche looking witch, witches, you know, like it's, it's like one of the, you know, we don't want to tell African stories or speak of African spirituality and have this kind of gaze that kind of puts down African spirituality or African, you know, um, tradition in a way. So we do have so-called witches in African society, but that's actually a Western definition. So for me, I, I just, you know, like to look at the idea of what is, you know, in terms of, you know, universal explanation, universal definitions, but in a very sort of like my own perspective or my own way of viewing what I consider to be our own way or our own lifestyle. So is, is she good or bad? Is she evil? Is she, you know, any of these things can be just people's fears, you know, people's, you know, ideas of, you know, things that have been told to them, you know, years and years and years and years, but without really having their own personal definition of it. So for me, it was all, all of those things about our society, my own lens on, 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 on what I, I think, or my own idea of witchcraft, as well as, um, you know, kind of subverting the idea of what an African witch is supposed to look like. But, you know, it's about putting a human face to it. And, and for me, when you explore human faces, you deal with, you know, everyday things, like in a university with, you know, young women and relationships. And, you know, those are the things that you tackle. And through that, then you will find the supernatural. But you don't start with the supernatural and hope that the humanity will manifest. I think you, you do it the other way around, at least in my, in my book. And I think I feel like you kind of like articulated what I said at the beginning, where it was like this feels really commonplace. Like in watching mm. all of those stories, like there's still something that's incredibly like recognizable about these individuals, although like really extraordinary things kind of like happen. And then you start to 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 kind of ask questions or you know it. it highlight something about society or culture in a certain way um and yeah like this what was really interesting for me in watching the film is just like this thinking and reflecting about what the labeling of which does to women and what their experience of that is like or just how that can actually like play out or the motivations behind doing that and there's a really small like throwaway line in in the film where it's just it's kind of it's kind of mentioned where it's just like you know people kind of use this term in a misogynistic sort of way like against women and and I think it's quite clear that there's something going on with joy in the film but you know I but at the same time there's something maybe could you kind of like speak a little bit to that in a sense of just like this yeah the way that that label is sort of applied and the motivations behind that was that something you were interested in as well as, you know. Yeah, it's definitely one of the subtexts. I mean, you, you can't but confront that. Like it's literally what we deal with on a daily basis. There are, um, there are businesses, I call them businesses, not religions, or another name for them, cults. They are literally businesses that have thrived in Nigeria by, you know, um, labeling women as witches, women and children as witches. You know, like, you know, a whole mission is a ministry. It's, it's a whole thing. You can Google it, you know. So it's, it's actually, this is actually a real thing. And it's a handful um, um, toxic sort of thing in our society where it's almost like, like almost like nobody even pays attention to it. Like it's become so ingrained in the toxicity of the, of the society that people rarely even pay attention to it. So it's, it's just thrown around, you know, you know, she's a witch, you know, ah, you witch, you know. So it's like, for me, that was really the, the context behind it. And yes, it does come, come from a misogynistic place, but then it takes on even a more um, like literal meaning in our society where it's no longer just, you know, just you using it to describe, you know, a negative behavior. But then it becomes like actually, you know, these women are witches. And so when they become witches in 
in real life, and I use the word witch is very loosely, even with the title, Suffer the Witch, it's, it's a biblical title and it's used um, deliberately in, in, in sort of like a, like a double innuendo sense where um, in, the, in the biblical quote, it says, you shall not suffer the witch to live. You know, and it's, you know, it's one of the commandments. So it means that if a woman is suspected to be a witch, you have to kill her. <laughs> That's it. No discussion, you know. And, you know, that, has, when, that scripture has always bothered the hell out of me. You know, even when I was a kid, you know, like uh, for some reason, I'm like, really? Like, you just, if she's a witch, you just kill her. Like, that's it. <laughs> no discussions. And that has carried on. It's not just like, a, you know, it carried on in different cultures, you know, obviously with the Salem witches and the trials and all of that. And it's no different in, in Nigeria society as well. You hear of witches being burned, you know, just women suspected to be witches and they are, they are set on fire. Some of them beheaded. These things happen within our, our society. And so for me, yes, it was, it was deliberate, but also to kind of like use those fears in a way to work against the narrative of what a witch could be or can be, you know, um, exploring, you know, and, and then you know, through the gaze of, of relationships and, and friendship and, and, and sort of all these very familiar ideas um, and, and use them in a way to sort of like highlight all the higher ideas in a way. I don't know if I succeeded, but those were the things that were running through my mind in terms of just um, exploring the society, but using very, very, very realistic um, day-to-day analogies or, or reference, if you will. Yeah, and it does sort of, it is this, the magic is something that just sort of springs up everywhere. Because as you were talking about that, I was thinking about um, love potion and you have this thing where it's this sort of misogynistic label that is used to kind of like perpetuate and execute like violence and a lot of harm towards women but it also speaks to how society is ordered or the gendering of society as well because in your film like um, Mercy's friend is just like well I used it on my husband like you know and it's <laughs> this thing that like you know like it's what people were doing to keep yeah it's just, it's thinking about it's just the fact <laughs> like, you know what I mean and it's just like why do we <laughs> why does she as a woman feel that she needs to do that in the particular environment that she comes so it's this it all kind of pops up and then in yam i don't know if you could call what um what happens because i've the character's name has escaped me but you have a male who was trying to kind of like secretly abort his girlfriend's child with a potion so it's just all of this it's this thing you know like the roadrunner sort of like running through um everything well, yeah, there's there's like um, I think in love potion there's a lot of like expectations on you know um, on what mercy, I guess the society in the film what mercy sh- you know should be, uh, you know the idea that she should um, be like this great cook because all women should be like great cooks but you know in the film she doesn't know how to cook you know at the beginning she's like burning her noodles and she doesn't she's like oh what am i gonna do you know by the time she gets um uh leonard um to sort of fall in love with her um he's expecting her to be able to sort of cook you know go to work he goes to work she gets back she cooks while he plays video games sort of thing and you know once he realizes that you know oh what you're not gonna cook then she understands that they're not like they're not sort of compatible. I mean, they have like different love languages. I think she describes it as uh, as that. But yeah, I mean, I, I did use that sort of cooking thing to try and play on sort of expectations. Um, Cause you know, I guess women are expected to just be able to, you know, cook, clean, you know, whether or not they work as well, it doesn't matter, but they just have to do certain, you know, things that society expects of them. Um, so yeah, I did try and play on that a bit. Um, I don't like like CJ says. I'm not sure if it sort of comes across, or I you know I succeeded really well in trying to do that. But yeah, that that was that was definitely the plan. And you know my my film was very much based on um, sort of I I've taken a lot of sort of Murakami references from his work, is uh, the novelist, and I've sort of just pumped the film full of 
lots and lots of nuggets, uh, some very overt, some very kind of um, a small. And his work really does just explore the very mundane, everyday things, ironing, cooking, going to a bar, having phone conversations, cats always tend to go missing. And then something really supernatural or mysterious or extraordinary will happen. And it's just taken as some kind of like, oh yeah, this is kind of normal. Um, So yeah, I mean, that's just tying into your other point of just like every day, um, the everyday thing is going on. But yeah, I I do want to mention that. There's a lot of kind of Murakami references in in my, um, my mercy is even based on like a Murakami um, character from Sputnik Sweet Up. Uh, Samayashi is a writer, and that's kind of where the genesis of the character sort of uh, came about um, as well. So, um, yeah. That's cool. I wanted to ask about that, but I think you've covered that really well. And I think yeah. it's so refreshing to have three very different examples of the everyday that are mm-hmm. like people say, people create where you can have this like really strong real, the realism that you talk about and the mundane in your work and then just go all the way over there with Abbas and then all the way over there with yours you know what I mean like it's it's like a it leaves like a really great impression and just makes for a really good viewing experience what I want to do now is for maybe just like circle back a little bit to Cyril 16 and your origins because I'm aware that there probably are not there are people who might be coming to your work like for the first time um so could you um I'm not sure which one of you wants to take this a little bit but just maybe let us know a little bit about um yeah the collective and like what your sort of like objective your objectives are as a trio um CJ you mentioned the white paper that you all launched in 2016 so like maybe could you could like incorporate a bit of that You're on mute. Yeah, um, it's pretty much been about the white paper. I mean, obviously with a few revisions every year and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I think our last update was just uh, some months back. So we do have, um, uh, obviously the the manifesto stays the same, the, the 16 points of the manifesto says the same, and anybody can look that up on if you Google it. Um, but, you know, in terms of the, the, the things that we, we are working on, um, the ideas are still the same. We have, um, I think we tapped, into, we tapped into something with Juju Stories and we hope to explore further into that world because it's, it's just such a rich world and we just barely scratched the surface with, with Juju Stories. And so right now we're currently developing a series on Juju stories, and uh, we would love to really um, go further into into you know the world of Juju, <laughs> you know. And um, we do have a feature film in the works. I can't really talk about that as well. Um, and these are like obviously projects that we're working together, um, writing together and directing together. Well, individually, we have um, our own projects. Um, I have mine, uh, Mami Wata, which is a Surreal 16 film. Um, you know, it fits into the manifesto. Uh, I've been developing um, that past six years. And um, I, I just we shot that in January in Benin, uh, here in Benin Republic. And uh, it's currently in, in editing, editing stage. So uh, uh, fingers crossed for... Uh, um, a world premiere next year, sometime um, festival premiere next year. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I mean, uh, Mike could probably speak on his. I know he's writing. Um, Abba is writing. So, um, yeah, that's really what we're about. As a, as a collective, what we want to do is, and I think, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that ever since we announced the collective with our manifesto, um, and after 2017, we formed the collective in 2016. Then we announced in 2017 to the industry. And we announced with uh, our anthology short film visions, which you know anybody can watch on YouTube. And the, the 
the attitude we got from the industry was pretty much like, you know, who the hell do they think they are? You know, like, you know, all, all of that stuff, you know. But I think over the years, people have come around and um, with our successes as a collective and our individual success, people are beginning to say, oh, okay, it's pretty cool, you know. Um, and I think, you know, people are, are starting to be more daring in their storytelling, especially as regards with Nollywood, you know. Um, some of the things that we complained about in our manifesto or highlighted in our manifesto, people are feeling more comfortable to move away from that, to try more uh, experimental um, sort of works, uh, even within Nollywood. And so, I mean, even if they don't give us the credit for that, that's fine. I mean, that was the whole point in the first place, you know, just to, to get people to, you know, see outside of themselves in a way to um, provide more, I guess, talents for the industry, because he has always bothered me personally that, you know, when you talk of Nigerian filmmaking, you only think of this one thing. And, and that isn't the case for other, um, even smaller countries. So why does it have to be so for a country with over 200 million people? That's never made sense to me. So um, yeah, I think, I think we're on the right path and hopefully with more collaborations, we hope to collaborate with even other collectives, you know, outside Nigeria and outside the continent even, you know, and we've been in touch you know, with others as well. Thank you. I do remember you saying that because I was there when I watched Visions. I don't know, was it like the premiere, the world premiere or something? And then you had that conversation at the end and people really didn't know that how to kind of like receive the work and the references. And I remember talking to you about it and you saying about having like, a national cinema that has multiple languages and that there's the possibility and there's kind of like a space to um, express that. And that was, yeah, four years ago. Mike, did you want to add anything or? Um, yeah, I think CJ mostly covered everything. Um, you know, we came together in 2016, my, uh, myself, CJ and Makama, um, and we just started talking um, mostly just in a WhatsApp group and we met up a few times and we just felt like there was a space for, or well, there was a lack of a space for people, you know, wanting to make more artistically minded films in Nigeria. Um, and we just felt like if we came together, then there would be sort of power maybe in more numbers. Um, and so we formed the collective, the Cyrus, called it the Cyril 16, and we drew up a manifesto with 16 points with a number of roles, uh, roles sort of inspired by the Dogma 95 uh, manifesto in that sense. Um, and in terms of things we were willing to do and things we were not willing to do. Um, and it was just our way to sort of maybe move, try and move Nigerian cinema or try and create a space more like for uh, Nigerian cinema outside of like the Nollywood um, behemoth you know, because um, I know when I was starting out in Nigeria, um, I was looking for sort of help with projects. A lot of the advice I was given is like, no, do it more like this, do it more like Nollywood, you know, and obviously that's not what I wanted to do. So um, I feel now, you know, four odd years later, five years later, um, like CJ was saying, there are, I feel like there, there's a lot more people doing more artistically minded works. Uh, and I think it's a really good thing. And, and, I, and I think it, it's something that's going to continue to grow as people see um, that there's actually opportunity outside of just doing um, uh, the Nollywood, the, the more Nollywood um, type uh, cinema. Uh, Cause I, I know that people have always wanted to do it but they just felt like, oh, well, I'm not gonna get anywhere in my career if I go that route. Um, but I feel now people seeing um, uh, us and others having a, a little bit of success, they're now more willing to sort of go that direction. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's really great to hear that people have like warmed to the work. Um, what has it kind of been like in terms of audiences like locally? Have you, what's like both of your experiences been of that? The, the domestic audience are just yearning for um, something big different. Um, I think we've seen it with um, 
genre films, like hard genre films, you know, being really, really more successful over the years, um, uh, like King of Boys, especially, you know, um, I know it's, it, it's not your traditional kind of romantic comedy or a uh, wedding film that you would expect to be like huge in Nigeria. Um, but, um, it just being a gangster film and a genre film, I do feel like that opens doorways for others um, to now come in with other genre films and even like some of like Juju stories. And I feel like if Juju is sort of given an opportunity, we'll go into like 12 cinemas across Africa. Uh, hopefully, um, no, sorry, we'll go into cinemas across 12 countries in Africa in this Halloween. So hopefully we do get to screen in um, uh, uh, Nigeria at some point in a cinema because uh, I, I feel like audiences would like this type of um, film. Um, I don't feel it's that difficult for them. I, I do, you know, despite the fact that people here, you know, the, you know, the, the powers that be will say, oh, it's not commercial enough and it's not this. But I, I feel like if you're given the opportunity, um, it, it will do well, you know, but that's just me. I, who knows? DJ? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, the, it's, it's, it's what it is. You know, the, the powers that be, they, they make the decisions. They, they decide for the people what, you know, what the people should see, you know, and that has been the case. And because of that, unfortunately, um, the people have been deprived of our works. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, our works are more um, recognized and more and screened more outside Nigeria than within Nigeria. Not of any fault of ours. Um, we would like, you know, the opposite to be the case, but it's not up to us really. I mean, with, uh, we, with the 12 countries, you have um, one cinema in Nigeria, that's in Abuja, but that's only because the um, Canal Olympia has, you know, has a cinema in Abuja. So, you know, with them showing in, in, the, in 12 countries, Nigeria just happens to be one of them. But we don't have a, a main cinema distributor distributing in, in Nigerian cinemas, which is a shame, I think, you know, especially for a film, you know, that opened at a, you know, global festival, a Nigerian film, all shot in Nigeria, all shot in Lagos, you know, opened at a great festival like Locano, even won a prize doing well in other festivals and there's no cinema distributor that is willing to take a chance on it. It's just sad. And that, and that for me is, is, you know, like one of the, the big hindrances, you know, that is holding Nigeria cinema back from being truly great. Because if, if you know, filmmakers are trying to come up and, and, and they happen to be inspired by what we're doing, and they're like, oh, but how do we make money? You know, if, if we don't, if we can't, you know, how our films shown in Nigeria cinemas, how am I going to sustain my career as a filmmaker? So that already kills, you know, the, you know in the minds of, of the young up and comer. And that doesn't encourage growth. So it has a domino effect across the industry that people don't, are not willing to confront or understand. Because, you know, for, I understand that it's a money decision, but at the same time, there's a money decision that is for now, and then you lose out in the end. And then there's a money decision that you kind of sow the seed and then you win big in the end. And I think this is, this is one of such. Yeah, I think they call it penny wise, pound foolish. Boom, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, you raise like a really significant issue and, you know, with what the sort of warming up that has happened in the last, you know, four years with the work that you've all gone on to do. Um, hopefully that's something with this sort of like wider distribution that you have across the continent, that is a possibility for you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, in Mike, when you were describing what you were doing, you said that there was like power in like numbers in terms of like-minded people like coming together. Um, and I was interested in, in how 
you have all sort of like developed as artists like individually like in this last like four years of working together okay um yeah uh i feel because i come from like a shorts background like making a lot of short films you know just by myself essentially you know with my own little camera uh, and just sticking them on youtube um and uh coming to nigeria i found like a lot of people were just making features um with almost no resources so i guess there was that sort of and it's different because i uh, you know i was raised in the uk and you know there's a way that industry works and it's very different from the way the industry here works you know people will just jump straight into features whereas in the uk you tend to be like oh let me you know, baby steps and eventually let me get to that stage. So, um, you know, I think in Nigeria is a cool thing. It, it, there's, there's benefits to it and there's, you know, there's the other side. Um, so I felt that kind of pressure <laughs> to just, all right, let me just use whatever resources I have and just make a feature. Um, and I did, you know, and I'm grateful that I did because I learned a lot. But I feel like we're all gradually sort of, we started with like like no resources, you know, even with our collective film, first film visions, it was like done just by ourselves, sort of begging and borrowing for um, tools and crew and stuff like that. Um, but I feel like gradually we're sort of like scaling up just little bit by little bit. I mean, Juju Stories is really low budget, but we, um, uh, we managed to get uh, funding. Uh, our producer, Oge Abasi, she, she managed to raise a little bit of money uh, through uh, France. This is a French Nigerian co production. So she managed to raise a little bit of money. Um, so we're, you know, we're able to hire people and get it shot really well. And um, so I guess we're, as artists, we're gradually trying to, or at least the plan is to just scale up um, with each project and just be able to sort of raise more uh, finance. So even with like my next project, you know, that's just my, um, that's my goal to raise more money. Um, I've recently done a short called Rehearsal, which was just on a, a much bigger scale than any short that I've ever done. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just scaling up. Uh, Cause you need to, to make films, you really do need a lot of, uh, to make the films that you want to make, you need resources. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, it's about raising more, raising more capital, essentially for me anyways. Um, I'm not sure if we have CJ still with us, but, um, we're actually coming up on time and I have one, my last question is you mentioned or A, that you're gonna, you, you're hoping to sort of like develop Juju Stories into a series. Um, mm. and then also that when you were sort of like developing this work you kind of had this very long list of like occurrences yeah. or scenarios like what were some if you can share like that didn't quite make the cut but just were equally as sort of like as bizarre and as fantastic as people playing into yams um, yeah um, we have there's there's a very popular sort of urban legend that we talked about uh, it's called madame koi um, uh, I think she's like famous for being some teacher in a boarding school. Um, she gets killed and then she haunts the students. She has like famous red heels and it's a popular urban legend over here. Um, there was uh, Yahoo Plus about sort of like an internet scammer. Uh, in Nigeria, they're known as like Yahoo Boys, uh, these internet, internet scammers. And Yahoo Plus is known as somebody who achieves a really high level of scam like sort of make, makes a lot of money and they usually are rich they do money rituals and stuff like that so uh, they may sacrifice a human being or whatever it is so yeah that's what they're sort of it's very sort of common a common sort of myth and urban legend here as well about money rituals um and i don't know uh, cj had one called ode oshi no ode oshi I don't know what that story is, though. Odeoshi, Odeoshi. It's uh, okay. it's basically just it's um it's a a charm, a charm that makes you impenetrable. 
So, um, okay. yeah, people who like who are like in criminal gangs and stuff, they go to like these, um, what you might call shamans or, or dog, you know, like traditional herbalists and stuff. And they will create, you know, these impenetrable charms for them. So when you shoot them, nothing happens or whatever. They are basically impenetrable. But to, to get this charm, you have to do something like really bizarre to make the charm potent. So sometimes they might, they might tell you you have to, you know, go and rape um, a mad woman, you know, street a homeless person, or you might go and spend the night in a, in a cemetery naked, you know, go and, um, you know, drink, you know, just something, you know, just something. And then with the combination of the charm, then you become impenetrable. So that was, I'm working on a story around that. Um, and then, of course, there's... Um, there's, uh, he, he mentioned the Koi Koi, which is also popular. And then there's, um, there's so many of them. I can't even remember. Like, there's just, like, the world is so huge. There's a push, the push baby, push baby. Yeah, there's yeah. bush baby. Yeah. Um, yeah. basically, the way it sounds, it's a baby in a bush <laughs> that it's cry, that cries. Yeah. And when people go to, you know, look for, look at, you know, what's going on, why is the baby crying? They disappear, you know, um, uh, it's yeah, it's it's all kinds of. Let me not let me not give everything away, but it's all kinds of what stuff. Gonna be in the <laughs> this is like, this is just to give people a bit of an insight into like what yeah. they can expect, um, or just like how much scope there is. Um, but we've actually come up on time now, so I just um, want to close by just like congratulating you on a really really wonderful <laughs> dynamic piece of work um and yeah just to thank you for giving us your time today and like sharing your film with us at the festival um and we can't wait to see what you do next thank you very much thank you Tega. yeah thanks Tega. thanks Sanati. <laughs> appreciate it